Church, how you feeling this morning? All right, sing with us on this next song. I search the world, but he couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise, the treasures of faith. Never enough 
How is everyone? So I just wanted to say a few things before this next song. Um, Sean will usually give me a call during the week and say, is there anything that's on your heart, your mind, a song that you might want to do? And I said, yeah, actually there is. It's a song by Matthew West. And uh, Chris had been wanting to do it for a while and we've been talking about it. But, you know, isn't it amazing that God sent his only son down, you know, to die for us so that we can be with him one day in eternity, that he paid the price He'd take the cross. So this song's been blowing up the radio. It's a song by Matthew S. It's called Me on Your Mind. So if you guys know the words, sing along. 
To find the one missing you feels like it was wrong with me on your mind. In the prodigal son who ran, leaving his home behind. The part where the father came running to me. Preparing a place where your mercy and grace When I stand before you Pray with me. Lord, we're just so thankful, you know, as, a, as we stand here today. And we just look up, take a look around us. We just see your creation and that you are the creator. And we just love you, Lord. And we just ask that you guide us. Guide us through this week and guide us um, as we listen to the message today. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to River Community Church here at Green Knight Conference Center. This is beautiful, isn't it? This is amazing. Uh, if you are a second grader or above and you signed up to go hang out out at the park, 
head over that direction, the top up there. We're going to have some fun for you guys to go and enjoy. So make sure you meet up there, up at the top of the sidewalk. Go have a blast. It'll be a good time for you guys. Uh, I am Sam. I'm one of the pastors here at RCC. And man, I love being out here with all of you. It is, I don't know, it's something about being out here. I was a little nervous, right? Last night, the storm's coming in. Will we actually get to be out here and spend some time together? It was pretty crazy and, and uh, all that sort of thing. I was worried we'd like have chainsaws going, like cutting up trees and stuff and make sure we'd have room because we were going to do it. We were going to get out here and have this service. So awesome. I'm glad you're here. We're in the series right now we're calling Represent. And it's all about looking at the book of Acts and seeing how the people in the book of Acts represented Jesus to their given communities. And uh, we're talking about how we can then do that ourselves in our own communities, in Ripon, Green Lake, Princeton, Berlin, all the areas, Oshkosh, Fond du Lac, that we are a part of the community. That's what we're talking about, how we can translate that from the book of Acts into our own lives. And, and I got to be honest with you this morning. I didn't really want to give this message today. <laughs> I wasn't super excited about it. I was a little nervous about it. I wasn't sure if this is the one that we wanted to do. This is a couple weeks ago, and I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, man, do I really want to talk about that? Do I really want to talk about that? Because there's some great things in the book of Acts. Like in the book of Acts, you see how this group of people are unified in a way that the world hadn't seen before. Like they were unified, even though they came from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnicities, different cultures, they were still unified because they followed Jesus. That sounds like fun to talk about. That sounds like a great thing to talk about. Uh, that's one of the things I could have talked about. I could have talked about how in the book of Acts, over and over again, they plant these churches and how we're still doing that today and, and how when a church goes into a community, it transforms the community and makes life better. We could have talked about that, but, but there's this other thing. This other thing that I just couldn't stop seeing as I was reading through the book of Acts I knew there was something there that I had to do. I kept on seeing it over and over again. I didn't necessarily really want to, but I knew I had to. In order to be obedient to what God wanted me to do, I had to do it. So here we are because, because I couldn't stop seeing this word, this one word. Over and over again, it, it came up. And it's not a nice word, okay? I'm just going to tell you that right away. It's not that kind of word that you write on a big old postcard. You put it on your fridge and you look at it like, oh, yeah, that's the word. That's the word. It's not the one you go to Hobby Lobby and you pick out in this frame, you know. It's got like nice scripted. You put it in your living room and you, you sit down and you look and it's just, oh, that's, that's so motivational. That makes me so happy. It's not one of those words. I got to tell you that right away from the beginning. It's not one of those words. It's not the kind of word that you drive miles to go in here because you're so excited about it. Sorry, you had to drive further today to be here. And you're like, why am I here? The fact is, I get angry when I see people use this word and use it poorly because I see it hurt people. And I don't like it when people get hurt when they use words like this from the Bible. I didn't necessarily want to talk about this world, but I couldn't not talk about this word. Because this word, it's actually mission critical for us as a church. It's mission critical to us representing Jesus well to our community. This word, it's actually essential for us if we want to live a life that is good and free and enjoyable and full of purpose. We, we need this word it's one of the like 10 most important words in the Bible if you did a word study. Like this one ranks up there as one of the most important words and we get it wrong all the time. You all want to know what the word is, don't you? <laughs> I'm going to make you work for it. I'm going to make you work for it a little bit. Uh, if you know anything about the Bible, one of the things you might know is that there's two books, the book Luke, which Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all about Jesus. They tell Jesus' life, the story. And the book Acts, which comes right after John. Luke and Acts are actually one book. They're the same book. There's part one, Luke, part two, Acts. And you can trace this word all the way through, Luke and Acts, from the beginning to the end. It's there throughout the whole thing. So, so here we go. John the Baptist, you've heard of him maybe, in the beginning of Luke, he says this. It says this about him. 
It says, then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. A few chapters later, Jesus, in chapter 13, Jesus says this. No, and I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. We're into Acts now. Peter, right at the beginning of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he says, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, Paul Acts 17, Paul says, God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. Have you figured it out yet? Repent, right? Repent. You're like, oh, I'm so glad I drove out to Green Lake this morning to hear him talk about that word. Maybe you've seen this before. Here, I got to jump down for a second. Maybe you've seen this before, right? Somebody standing there on the corner, and please don't take my picture right now because this is not what I really mean. But they're sitting there, and they're yelling through the bullhorn, and they're saying this crazy thing on the sidewalk, and you see this, and you're like, oh, man, no, don't do that. How many of you have seen that guy? Or girl, it could be girl, right? Like, yeah, it could be either. You've seen that person, and you're like, no, no, don't do that, don't do that. Oh, I hate those signs. Because even saying that word, I can feel you squirming in your seats. I can feel it. But before you squirm your way out of here, you need to know something. This word, repent, doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't. Here's what most people think of when they hear that word. Most people hear that word or see it on a sign, and, and their first instinct is that person is telling me to be ashamed, be very ashamed, hang your head, beat yourself up. Think about just how bad of a person you really are. That's our gut instinct. That's what we think when we see that word, and that's what they think they're telling us. Hear me this morning. It doesn't mean that. Now, don't get me wrong. There's this hint of remorse in this word. It's there. It's important. But it barely makes the list of the definition. Because of our culture, when we hear the word repent, all we think about is feeling bad. That's not how this word is used. It's actually a good thing. We'll get to how this word is used in just a minute. But first, first I have to ask you guys a question. Let's kind of get to it. Uh, I've got this nice little map here. I'm wondering, did any of you get lost on your way here this morning? Like there, there are flags, so hopefully we guided you in real nicely. And you really just got to stay in the same road the whole time. But there's some attractive little offshoots, aren't there? Like, I'm going to hop off on this one. How, how many of you went to the church? Any of you? Like, thinking the service was there? A couple people? All right, good, good, good. But in order to grasp this word, I need us to think about something. Uh, a couple weeks back, our family was up at a Peninsula State Park, and we were driving around. Uh, we were going to see it. Uh, there's this spot. It's called like Eagle Terrace or something. There's this big old structure. It's brand new. They made it so it's handicap accessible, so you can uh, take this ramp all the way to this really tall thing. And it's kind of like this, where you can, you can look over an entire lake, and it's beautiful. It's amazing. So we were on the other side of the park. And on the other side of the park, uh, we got a map, and we're trying to drive from there to the other spot. And so we've got the map out, and I give the map to my son, my oldest son, and he hasn't used the map yet, right? So this is fun, like a little dad teaching moment. So we got to figure this out, right? Like, how are you doing? Like, you're looking at it like this. Have any of you ever done this in the car? We don't do that anymore, but maybe you once you did do that. But you're experiencing that. You're looking at this map, and you're getting frustrated, and you, you just throw it down. And you start, right. But anyways... Here's the thing. We're going there, and he has his map. I have my GPS on, and I'm trying to help him understand how to read a map. So, like, one, I can look smart because I have my GPS and I know where we are. And two, uh, I can help him find it and figure out how to do it because he's into that sort of thing. So it's fun. But the first thing you have to do when you're looking at a map is what? Figure out where you are on it. 
figure out where you are on the map. And you can do that in a couple ways. If you're walking around and there's like trail maps, there's that big blinking sticker thing that says you are here. You got to find that on the map. You are here in this place. So we started doing that, looking for landmarks and that sort of thing. And the second thing you got to do is another thing. You got to figure out what? Where you're going. You got to know where you are. You are here. And you got to know where you're headed. Which direction are you going? And so we were going through that. It, it was really fun uh, as we're doing that. As he got those two bits of information, made sure the map was pointed the right direction. He did awesome. It, it was super fun. But those are the first two things you need to know. Even on a GPS, they ask you two questions. Where are you starting from? And where are you headed? Where is your destination? Those are two steps, but there's actually a third. There's a third step. And, and this is the step that can really mess you up if you're not careful. Uh, we were down in Milwaukee a while back, uh, with two older boys, we were in the car, and it was later in the evening, like 9.30, and we were headed back, we were in a parking garage, and so you, you put the GPS on, and you're, you're saying, okay, we're in Milwaukee, we're headed to Ripon, help us get there. And so we go down there, and, and you, you leave, and, and we start to move down the road. I'm looking at my GPS. We're good. And I, I get, sorry, I've got an air of frustration. There are too many 40 numbers in Wisconsin highways. Is anybody with me? 41, 44, 43. You don't know which one is which. And I know from experience, don't go on 41 right away in downtown Milwaukee. You got to go around that. That's important. It's helpful, especially 930 at night. So I was like, okay, no, don't go on 41, don't go on 41. And then I go this other way, and I, I see 43. I'm like, I think that's the one. And my GPS is being a little goofy, weird. So I take 41, 43 north to Green Bay. <laughs> have any of you ever done that? A few of you have. It's not so bad. The GPS rerouted. We had enough battery in the phone, thank God. <laughs> and, and we made it back home safely. But the reason that happened is because I thought our car was pointed one way, it was really pointed the other way. So you gotta figure out which direction am I actually pointed? Where am I headed? In map terms, it's what's true north on the map. So you can read it right. Navigation is tough, but if you have those three things, it's a good start. Navigation has everything to do with this word, repent. When you, when you look at it up, when you look it up in the uh, Greek version of it, the word repent is the Greek word metano, metano. Can you say it with me? Metano. It's like met, like the Mets, on, like I'm on the stage, and oh, like a good Wisconsin, oh, right? <laughs> metano. Say it with me. Ready? Metano. Here's what it means. Essentially, this means to change one's mind or purpose. To change one's mind or purpose. When we shorten that, we, we shorten it to repent. That's essentially what the word repent means in English. So that's the word we use, but it's, it's in a bigger sense to change one's mind or purpose. So when Peter says in the third chapter of Acts, he says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. And we immediately think, be ashamed, be very ashamed of what I've done. We're hearing him wrong. We're hearing him wrong. Hear these words because I'm only going to say them once. He's not saying, dwell on how bad of a person you really are. He's not saying that. He doesn't want you dwelling. He wants you turning. He does not want you dwelling. He wants you turning. And, and by the way, He's likely talking to people, Peter is in this moment, he's talking to people who had just been in the crowd that shouted, crucify him to Jesus. Bad can you get, right? They had thought a certain way about Jesus. Peter is telling them, change your mind about Jesus. Repent. Change your mind or purpose. Repent. He's basically asking them to say, I was wrong. I'm going to change the direction I'm headed with my life. It's, it's like you're driving a car 
You're, you're looking at your map, you've got your GPS location locked and loaded, and suddenly you realize something. Suddenly you realize the map was turned upside down. Suddenly you realize the destination you plugged in was not the right one. Have you done that before? I need to put a new address in my iPhone. I need to turn around. I need to change direction. That's the word, repent. I need to change my mind, change my, part, my purpose. That's repentance. My, my wife and I, we have three boys, 10, 8, and 2. And uh, earlier this summer, I was talking to my wife, Meg. Hi, yeah. Um, I was talking to my wife, Meg, and uh, uh, we were discussing about how we knew this was coming, but it had finally arrived where today was like the first day, it was the beginning of the summer, where, where we really felt like our whole purpose in life was to be a taxi cab uh, or an Uber, right? Have you experienced that at some point in your life where you're just like going around from place to place, literally driving them everywhere? And uh, there was this day, and I think I said it, uh, I, I was leaving from work and I was headed to go and pick up our youngest son uh, at the end of the day, and I remember getting almost to the driveway and realizing I'm at the wrong house. Have any of you raised your hand? Like you just go on autopilot. I went all the way to the wrong place to pick up my child. I don't even know where he is. Like I just clicked in to this moment and I'm just going to this place. I'm at the wrong place. Like the sole purpose, right, is, is just to go in that place. As you go on autopilot, you're just so used to it. You're doing all the things. You're getting distracted and you just... You just go on autopilot. How many of you, uh, you said, some few of you guys went to the church already today, right? Like when you do that, it's on autopilot. It's just what you do on Sunday mornings. Here's the thing about repentance. The very first step of repentance is realizing which direction you're headed. It's the wake up from the days of life moment. It's the, an alarm to wake you up. It's, it's looking up from your iPhone and checking out these surroundings, which, by the way, how about these surroundings? It's beautiful. It's, it's the, is this really where I want to be? Is this really where I want to be going with my life? The things we do without even thinking because we just assume we're headed in the right direction, that's, that's autopilot, right? Doing it without thinking. The other word that Peter uses in that moment where he says, repent, it's another doozy. He says, repent of your sins. Now, there's another really fun word. That's for another day. But we could go on for months about those two words. For the sake of time, I just want to give you a, a quick definition of that second nice, fun, scary word. Sin is what you do when you live counter to what God wants for you. And, and if you drill down a few levels, like, that's the first initial thing, right? Living counter to what God wants for you, that's sin. But if you go further down, you could define it even further, and you could say that sin is anything you do to damage a relationship. It can happen in two ways. We sin when we, when we do damage to our relationship with other people, and we sin when we do damage to our relationship with God. Sin is almost always relational. Sometimes we, we do it on purpose. Sometimes we very purposely do something that's, that's just super selfish. And we, that, that's a sin, right? That's something that some people do. But most of the time, most of the time it's mindless. Most of the time we just stumble into it. We're so in the habit of it. We, we live on autopilot, do what other people around us are doing. We, we do what our bodies crave and, and don't think about the long-term long -term consequences of those actions, the long game. Sin often happens because we haven't really thought about where we're going and how we're going to get there. That word repent, it's the blaring siren. It's the alarm saying, wake up, check the map, see which direction life is pointed, choose a new direction. One of the places that this plays out a lot is in relationships, kind of obviously, right? This happens a lot. And today, because I know this is a, a tough topic, I wanted to give you a gift. Th this thing that you can do that I, I guarantee you will improve your relationships. It will make your relationships better. I, I promise you this. Do you, do you want to hear it? Yes. Okay, nod your heads. You're still with me. Good. It's hot, I know. It goes hot, cold, hot. I, I get it. But okay, you want to go, you're tracking with me. 
But it's this thing that you can do with relationships, friendships, dating relationships, parental relationships, and, and especially marriages. There are three words that you can say that will immediately improve your relationships. Three words that will immediately help you feel closer to someone if you say them properly and if they're received properly. Three words. They'll bond you together. They will increase your love life if you're married. They will increase your fun and joyfulness and closeness with people. They're powerful. And these three words are not I love you. Maybe you were thinking that was it. Those are not the three words. They're great words, and you should say those words, and you should mean those words, but those aren't the three words. Are you ready for them? Three words. I was wrong. Say it with me, ready? I was wrong. Some of you are laughing because you're like, I never said that before. Or others of you are like, I've never heard my spouse say that before. <laughs> and it's good to laugh, right? It's fun. Doesn't it feel good? And, and I hope you can laugh, but, but I'm dead serious. If you're willing to realize when you are wrong and say it and mean it, and if the person you're saying it to doesn't use it as something to hold over you and say, oh man, I told you, all that kind of stuff. If the person you're saying it to doesn't say that, that's one of the most powerful ways to grow bonded together. You will both feel safer together because you can trust that you can be honest and you can trust that they will be honest with you. I was wrong. Repentance is doing that. It's saying, I was wrong. It's saying, I was headed in a direction I shouldn't have been going. It was hurting me. It was hurting you. It was hurting my relationship with God. It's the orientation moment. It's realizing which direction is true north on the map, which direction your life is pointed. But, but it doesn't stop there. It's a change in mind and purpose, which means you still need to do two other things. The first thing is this. You need to figure out where you are on the map. And the second thing is, you need to figure out where you're headed. That, that first one, that's a tough one. It means taking an honest assessment of your life. And in Romans chapter 12, it says this. It says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Now, that's some motivational stuff right there. Don't think you're better than you really are. <laughs> that's not what you're used to hearing, right? But you have to have that moment, right? You have to have this moment where you see things as they are, as they actually are. Honest self-assessment. It's the how's my marriage moment. It's the how's my relationship with my friends moment. It's the when, when I think about my life and the time I'm, I'm giving towards different things, what am I saying with my time is most important. It's the how am I treating my kids moment. It's the am I taking time to grow closer to God? Do I, do I ever talk with him by praying? Do I ever listen to him by, by reading his words? Do I ever spend time with other people who are trying to follow him too? Is that part of my normal everyday life? Where am I at? It's that moment. Repenting of your sins means admitting the things that have become more important than God in your life and choosing to turn from them or at the very least put them below God on your priority list. Second, you have to decide where am I headed? Remember that word, metano. Metano means to change your mind or purpose. And when Jesus gets involved in this discussion, it's not a matter of what am I living for, What's my purpose? It's who. Who am I living for? Who is my purpose? It's a relationship. Love is so much more powerful. Sometimes people refer to Jesus as Lord. You maybe will hear that phrase if you're in a church for a long time. You'll hear the word Lord. But that, that's really just an old word for the term leader. Leader. Who is leading your life? What's true north? What GPS destination do you have plugged in? Is it Jesus or is it something else? 
when John the Baptist, when, when Peter, when Paul, when, when Jesus says repent, they mean change your purpose. Make it your purpose to live a life of following Jesus. That's where freedom happens. Seems backwards, right? Like, I'm going to choose to have him dictate how I live my life. You'd think that that would be more restrictive, but in reality, we already restrict ourselves all the stinking time to anything we decide is more important. If it's our schedule, if it's our kids, if it's, if it's this one thing we really want to do, if it's the sport, if that becomes more important than God, you're now a slave to that thing. Like, that's what dictates your life. It, it chooses every decision. And so to repent is to say, no, that's, that's gonna, it's good. It's a fine thing. I like that. I'm going to lower it down. I'm still going to follow God. I'm gonna, still going to follow Jesus over these things. That's where freedom is. When Jesus is your leader, that's where freedom comes in. And I could go on and on and on. I don't have time, but I have one more thing. And it's so important. We're in the series, right? We're calling Represent. And one of our focuses for the year is to represent Jesus well. In order to represent Jesus well, it is mission critical. Mission critical to make repentance a practice, not a one and done thing. A practice. When, when you're driving down the road and you've got the steering wheel, right, and you're, you're going somewhere, I don't know if you drive like this or like this or like this or like this, I don't know how you drive, but you got your steering wheel, right, and you're headed in a certain direction and you're going somewhere. You're doing two things. You're looking where you're going, right, and you're constantly correcting. I mean, if you stop correcting for so long, you go over here, you got a big adjustment to make. When we make repentance, when we make saying, saying, God, I, I have these things in my life. I, I have this thought. I had this thing I did the other day. It's not a big deal. It's small stuff. But it's saying, hey, I recognize that wasn't following you the way I should have been following you. And then you choose to say, I'm going to follow you now instead. That's repentance. It's the tiniest little thing. It doesn't have to be this burdensome thing. It's the smallest little prayer. It says, God, I'm going to follow you instead. And that changes everything. When you're doing those tiny corrections on a regular basis, that's the beauty of repentance. It makes life fuller, more joyful, more free. It, that's where it's at. This is my little guy, by the way. Silas, can you say hi to everybody? Say hi. Good job. All right. <laughs> to live a life that represents Jesus well, it, it requires for us that we do the inner work of regularly looking up the road and regularly making those course corrections. Some days they're the big ones. You did the thing and you shouldn't have, and it's to own up to it and live with it. Most of the time, it's the smallest little stuff, the tiniest little things. It's the regular check-in. It's, it's in the prayer, God, forgive me. Forgive me as I forgive those who sin against me. I say, forgive me on a regular basis. It's, if we're going to represent Jesus well, this is where it's at. Let's practice. Let's finish with that. I'm going to say a prayer. And, and I don't know where you're at this morning. You're having a great sunny day. It's beautiful. The weather finally turned. It's hopefully going to be a little cooler. And you're thinking about your day. This is my hope, is that this prayer that we're about to say would be something that would help you live a little more free today, a little more purposeful today, because you chose to say, God, I, I agree with you. I want to live for you over these other things. I know that thing wasn't so good for me or for my relationship with you or those other people. I want to follow you. And that's a look at what repentance is. So if you want that for yourself this morning, would you pray with me right now? Dear God, thank you so much for this beautiful place to worship you. As we spend this morning thinking about what it looks like to live for you, to follow you with our lives, we know that, that you're the leader. Uh, you're the one that we want to follow. You're, you're Lord, you're leader of our lives. We want to choose to make that the way that we live. So God, as we spend this morning just for a minute, we're thinking about our lives. We're thinking about some of our decisions, some of the things that we're doing that, that we're putting first in our lives. Some of the things we do without even thinking, but we know when we think about it, it, it hurts our relationship with you. It hurts our relationship with others. It's damaging to us. God, we, we say we're sorry. We, we know that that's not good for us, and we know that you don't want that for us. We're sorry. Please forgive us. And now, God, 
Help us to live for you, to choose to do the kinds of things that you want us to do with our life. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And it's so good to be here with you. Um, in a, after the service, in a moment, uh, I'm going to be up here. Uh, one of the things it talks about in each one of those verses is after they repent, after they follow Jesus, they choose to be baptized. If that's something you're interested in doing, it's, it's just all over the Bible. That's the steps that you take. That's the next step. I'm going to be down here after the service, and if you want to talk to me about that, I would love to chat with you about that. But with that, why don't we stand up, and let's finish with a couple more awesome songs to finish out the service. Thanks for being here this morning. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all its stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus.
Yeah.